What is your reward? My salvation is my reward. What is your craft? My craft is death. What is your pledge? My pledge is eternal service. I don't need anything else. That's the intro. You remember back in the day when you were at school and as soon as you got home, you booted up your Xbox 360 and proceeded to lose hours of your life to games that were just simple, badass, and fun to play? Yeah, that's how I felt playing Space Marine 2. And if you have not played it yet, well, you're not a heretic, are you? As someone who has never played anything Warhammer related, not even the first game, because it's not on console, and I'm not running games on my Lenovo ThinkPad anytime soon, the only insight I had into this franchise, besides Angry Joe, was a friend who is pretty much fluent in Warhammer lore. He's got the models in his house, and when you get him drunk, he'll just start describing the entire history of each faction in perfect detail. What's the deal with the Eldar? Alright, Blake, <laughs> sounds cool, but let me tell you about the Witch of Eyes. Is that a spaceship with churches on it? Holy fucking shit. That's the most badass thing I've ever seen. Yeah, after playing Space Marine 2, I could see why this franchise is so beloved. Everything about this game is badass. Just beefed up men in massive armor, murdering aliens while screaming out voice lines that will make you want to run through a wall. It's got so much testosterone that feminists around the world are being triggered as we speak. Oh my god, did you just make a game that appeals to the male fantasy? You'll bet your sweet bippy I did! This game continues the 2024 trend of games that are just plain old fun to play. Helldivers 2, Dragon's Dogma 2, at least for the first few hours, Stellar Blade, Black Myth Wukong, and now this. So many games now want to take you on a journey. Nah, I don't want to. Just give me a gun and let me shoot hordes of Tyranids. And better yet, let me just rip a heretic's head off. You got that? <laughs> well, sign me up. I'll be glad had to stomp out the Emperor's enemies. God, I miss feeling like a man in video games. But let's take a step back. What makes Space Marine 2 such an awesome experience, and why does it feel like such a breath of fresh air? Well, let's get juiced, shall we? So strap in, boys and girls, and let's get down to business. In Space Marine 2, you once again become the beef boy himself, Captain Titus, or in this case, Lieutenant Titus, fresh off his completed service with the Death Watch, he once again becomes an Ultramarine to help the Imperium fend off the relentless Tyranid fleet, along with an unexpected foe that threatens the galaxy itself. Before I talk gameplay, I just have to say, I don't know what the budget was for this game, but I would assume it was less than most PlayStation exclusive games. Why am I saying that right now? Because Space Marine 2's visuals throw those games into the warp. As soon as you drop in, you are greeted with just magic. These are some of the coolest looking backdrops I have ever seen in any video game. It's literal eye candy at its finest. We don't need realistic graphics. We need more shiny shiny. We don't need more detailed trees in the distance. We need thousands of Tyranids trampling over them. You want to feel like you're in a war zone? You're going to be right at home with this. Also, this may be something small, but am I the only one who adores how the Vox sounds in this game? My lord, we are preparing an airstrike. Can you hold the enemy in place until it hits? By the Primarch, we have set a mighty pyre this day. Saber did not pull any punches when it comes to aesthetic. It's a literal 10 out of 10. You cannot argue with that. Airstrike incoming! It also fuels my delicate little ego when you walk by Cadian soldiers and they all kneel to you and they refer to you as my lord. Yeah, you're damn right I'm your lord. Of course, as a space marine. No, no, you're not part of this. You're thrown right into the fire. And Jesus Christ, there is a lot of fire. Space Marine 2 is focused on one thing and one thing only, and that is whooping some good old Tyranid ass. And my God, does it feel absolutely glorious. 
You're gonna be fighting horde after horde of enemies, and you got two options. You either shoot them with guns that feel incredible, heavy bolter for the win, or you can melee them with different weapons, including a chainsaw sword? Oh, yeah. I must sound like the biggest noob to Warhammer fans. Yeah, these have been around since the 80s. What are you so surprised about? I'm sorry I'm new, okay? There's a bunch of different guns you can use, ranging from bulk guns to plasma guns, mini guns, sniper rifles. They all look kind of similar, not gonna lie, but I don't care. As long as they shoot, just get the job done. And along with the chain sword, you have a combat knife, which is meant for faster combos, and a power sword, which is a beefed up chain sword, but let's be real, it's not as cool. Oh, and also, a massive hammer that turns your enemy to smithereens. It's the hammer! He's ringing! And once you're done shooting and slashing, you then have the opportunity to pull a glory kill straight out of doom. And damn, some of these are freaking brutal. Feel the wrath of the emperor, you miserable plebs! I love this game. Also, I heard in the first game that you'd still take damage when doing these. Thank God that's not the case here. I would have died multiple times. But when you do this, you recover a bit of your armor, which, yeah, by the way, this game has the rally mechanic. When you take damage, you can recover it by hitting and killing enemies. And when you perform an execution, it refills completely, which when you have a horde shooter like this is kind of a necessity because you're not surviving long in this if you don't have it. But along with that, you can parry enemies in this game. Each enemy with different timings, allowing you to hit him with that sweet... Can I just say, even though it's very easy, there's something so badass about this specific one with Titus just holding his arm up to catch the Tyranid before it even jumps. Like he already knows it's coming. And that, that Tyranid has to be thinking in midair. Oh shit, I'm dead. I've seen some people criticize the parry and that it kind of feels clunky, which I don't know, I could kind of see where they're coming from, but once I figured out the timings, it became much more clear, so I don't really feel there's a problem here, but maybe that's just me. You also have a special buff ability that also recovers your armor and health with each kill. These abilities can vary depending on who you play as in the campaign. Like if you play as Gadriel, you get a big fire AoE, which damn, I wish I could switch that out to Titus. That's awesome. But either way, this is what you're going to be doing for the whole game, and everything about this game gameplay looks and feels incredible but that's also kind of the biggest problem in space marine 2 you just shoot and whack in this game there's nothing else although this definitely feels like an xbox 360 game in the best way there's also nothing to break that up so by the end this starts becoming very repetitive for as great as it feels where in something like Gears 1, you had the light turret section, or in Halo, where you have different vehicles to get in. Hell, even in the first game, I saw that you're on a heavy gun in a helicopter. Space Marine 2 is just you doing the same thing for the entire campaign, and it can drag, like, a lot. I'm not even sure if there's a lore reason as to why Space Marines can't use vehicles. I know the Dreadnoughts are powered by the psyches of dead Space Marines. Yes, for the uninitiated, you heard that right, but something to keep the gameplay fresh, and unfortunately, nothing like that is here. But if that's the worst thing I can say about your game, I think you're in pretty good shape. It's just pure fun, and that's really what all of us asked for, and we certainly got that. So before we go further, we have to talk story first because everything else will make sense after that, especially with another mode, which I'll get to later. And because I just feel like getting to it now because the campaign. So this game takes place following the events of the first game where Titus is accused of heresy and thrown into the Death Watch as punishment. Now, I said I didn't play the first game, but I did watch the cutscene walkthrough so I would have more context to everything that happened. And let me just say, in the first game, Titus was bland as shit, at least until the very end. Now, because of that end, there's more interest behind him after the revelation that he can interact with Chaos Energy and not be affected, which to the uninitiated is something that only the forces of Chaos can do, also known as the Heretics. You could see the dilemma here. He also got a BUFF in the voice acting department. Look, I like Mark Strong, he's a G, but compare this... You want to talk to your gods? I will send you to them. 
unleash the fury you showed in the Aurelian Crusade. And we will be glad to have even a few blood ravens with us. To this. Are you not the Lord Castellan's soldiers? Fight, damn you! Your duty is to the Emperor. You will die when and where he so chooses, not over some personal vendetta. Do you understand? Yeah, I thought so. I can't understate just how much Clive Standin elevates Titus as a character with just his voice alone. He feels so much cooler than in the previous game. Hell, the voice acting all around is incredible, even random NPCs, which by the way, Holy shit, some of the commander speeches in this game. You will give your life in the name of our holy emperor. Sir, yes, sir. Will you give your life in the name of all that is good and pure? In the name of our holy emperor. Sir, yes, sir. Then take up the Canadian standard and hold it high so that the enemy will know the name of the executioners. <laughs> But now we get into spoilers, so you know the drill. Don't want to know? Here's the timestamp. Alright, let's roll. The story of Space Marine 2 is not as interesting as some other video game stories you might see out there, but the way I see it, it's good enough to keep you along for the ride. Certainly more interesting than the first game. The reason for that is, along with Titus' established character from the end of the first game, he has a new squad to command that bounce that backstory off of him, and bounce it off pretty damn well. Gadriel and Chiron, who are skeptical at first since they don't know who he is and he just shows up and now all of a sudden he's their leader. He's not in the database since his records were scrapped upon joining the Death Watch, so yeah, I'd be asking questions too. It also doesn't help that during one of the missions to save the Inquisitors, the ship gets shot down, it looks like it's shot down by the forces of chaos, and when they go to check on it, he becomes weak. Turns out, there's a chaos relic on the ship, which he has a reaction to after the encounter with Nemiroth in the first game, and the others are understandably like, bro, you good? But Titus doesn't want to explain anything because it's not their business. But then when they save Luz and he recognizes Titus' name, he says that Titus died on Gryia because nobody could be able to withstand that amount of chaos energy. So your commanding officer has no records on him past his first term of service, he's acting weird around chaos relics, he's fixated on classified files from the Adeptus Mechanicus, and apparently he's supposed to be dead because of a high exposure to chaos, but he's not, while also refusing to explain everything in a straightforward manner. So yeah, he's not exactly earning your trust here. Brother, what happened on Gryer? Nothing good. Can you be specific? I would sooner focus on the mission at hand. You are withholding information relevant to the mission at hand. Mind yourself, Sergeant. Your behavior has been erratic. You force your way into classified files. You tell us nothing. Gadriel, we deserve to know who is leading us. This conversation is over. This goes on for the majority of the campaign, a case of specifically Gadriel being suspicious of Titus to the point where he starts to not trust him at all and even requesting a transfer to another squad. Now this could fall into the trope of a plot revolving around characters just not saying what needs to be said because of the reasons why. If he says it, we have no story. <laughs> But the writers know this, so they write that flaw into Titus's character and his backstory. He doesn't handle his own men questioning his motives well, which leads to a pretty great scene between the three of them. Sir, I must apologize for my actions on other days. Unnecessary. I fell prey to suspicion. Almost killed him. When I was a young captain, Questioned my motives, brushed his concerns aside, and I paid the price. Your suspicions arose because I failed to answer your doubts. As I failed to answer his. Stand by for suborbital drop. I'm honored to fight beside you both. As are we, brother. You grew up on Calf. I'll send myself a small dead today. Why, sir? 
and it's not just Gadriel who gets more focus. Chiron has given some interesting backstory too. This man is from the planet of Kalf, which was raided and destroyed by heretics, which gave him a burning hatred for them and a strong sense of the warp. So when the Thousand Suns show up, this man goes berserk, and they have to try and calm him down. And when the Psyker tries to trick the squad into turning on Titus, Chiron sees right through it, specifically because he has a stronger sense of the warp, which pretty much saves Titus's life. This may not sound like much, but after the first game where Leandros and Sidonis were just the I live to serve you companions, at least until the end you little shit, Gadriel and Chiron actually feel like they're their own people with their own personalities. Couple this with the trio having just incredible dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I thought a beast of that statue would offer more sport. It was outnumbered. I once faced a Carnifex alone, but nothing but a bolt pistol. That was sport. Well, I am glad to share in the glory of this kill. The testosterone. It's too much! But throughout the game, you'll be taking orders from your Scottish commander, Acheron, because we have a Tyranid invasion, which is going well, fending them off, until all of a sudden, the Thousand Suns show up. Now, I want to point something out real quick. There's this ultramarine named Varelis that's really hyped up by Chiron in this third mission. We were once defending the stronghold from an orc assault. A war boss overpowered me. Had his drill against my head. Varelis appeared. Cut the bastards off. But five minutes later, he gets blown up by an ambush. I mean, he's used as a plot device to introduce the Thousand Sons. I mean, this scene is pretty great besides that, but damn, why hype a guy up so much just to do him dirty like that? I don't think this guy has any expanded lore on him out there in the ether, but even still. Now, up until this point, the story has been pretty decent. Nothing really to write home about, but I'm enjoying what's being put in front of me. I feel like I'm getting something out of this. This final act is pure cinema. The Thousand Sons led by Imaroth have gone to Demirium to steal the power of the weapon classified as Project Aurora, which is the same chaos energy that Titus dealt with on Graia. So... Yeah, I'd want to deal with that as soon as possible. Which leads the entire Ultramarine Legion on Demirium to band together and stop the activation of the weapon. Coming complete with sections of the entire Legion moving out together. A backdrop that can give somebody a heart attack. A goddamn Egyptian looking bird demon. This thing... Yeah, you know that weird bird that was flying around earlier? Jesus Christ. <laughs> There's a fan theory out there that this is Varelis. I refuse to believe that's not true. And also, one of the most badass sections... You know what? I'm just gonna play it for you. All setting up the arrival of Lord Kalgar, who, I'm not a Warhammer fan, so there's a bunch of lore behind this man that I don't know. But he's been mentioned throughout the game, a whole mission is centered around taking back a relay to send a warning message to him, so he's set up as a pretty important guy. After playing the final act, my conclusion is, Marnius Kalgar is a f***ing badass. Imara freezes all of the space marines in sight with his chaos magic, then opens up a portal to the warp, and Kalgar just breaks out of it like it's nothing, then hops into the portal to follow him. Now, Warhammer fans, I think I need some help here. 
From what I've gathered, the warp is essentially hell, and I've heard some people say that it's physically impossible to go there without being disintegrated, but I've also heard some people say that you can survive there, albeit for a short time. I don't know how accurate this game handles it, so let me know in the comments if this section was lore breaking at all, or if they were faithful. This leads to a great sequence and a pretty good boss fight, and that's it. Titus has proven his worth to the Legion, and all claims of heresy have been swept away, and he is called away on another mission. But before he goes, he receives a revelation. The chaplain that has been monitoring his actions for the whole game... I will show no mercy. Leandros. Why? Hello there, you smug little shit. How's it feel to be proven wrong? It's not gonna be a story that wins awards, but nobody really asked for that. All it had to do was be better than the first game and make Titus a more interesting character, which it absolutely did. So outside of the campaign, you have two other modes to play, PvP and Operations. Starting with PvP, which, holy shit, I did not think this would be this good. Although, why is there no description for the game modes? What the hell am I looking at? For both of these, but especially for the PvP, you have class loadouts. You got Tactical, which is the base class that you play as in the campaign. Then you have Assault, which focuses on melee and has a jetpack. Vanguard, which is a light melee focused with a grappling hook that can hook onto enemies and stun them. Bulwark, which turns you into a literal knight. Sniper, which, along with the obvious, allows you to turn completely invisible. And I mean completely. Like, this isn't like camo in Halo. You literally cannot see them. I've only caught them a few times, but damn, I can only imagine how much these guys can piss people off if you use them right. And my personal favorite, heavy. No melee, just a big ass minigun and an overshield. That's right, we have become the Terminator. But the crazy part about this is none of these classes are broken, as far as I can see. Every one of them have strengths and weaknesses and counters from other classes. Tactical, Vanguard, and Assault can be taken care of in normal ways. Snipers only have long range expertise which means if you get in close, you're not gonna have a good time. Bulwarks can use their shields to block gunfire almost indefinitely, but you could try to aim for their feet or the top of their heads, or you could just use the vanguard and grapple to them, which knocks the shields out of the way and stuns them. And heavies have a lot of armor, but not a lot of health. And since they don't have a melee weapon, classes like that can just get up close and do their thing. It's a blast going through this. Even though when I first tried to, I somehow couldn't get into a game for at least five days. Thank god that bug was fixed, why was that even there? But in terms of maps and modes, you got three of each. A little concerning, Team Deathmatch, Domination, and King of the Hill, which the modes themselves are great, and the maps themselves are as well, but why only three? Was this not ready for release? It sure feels like that. It feels very weird, like, why is it so limited? I have no doubt that more will be added post-launch, but I'm not sure I like the fact that this is all there is now. Please, Saber, if you add gun game, well, actually, I don't know what I'm gonna do, but please add gun game! Now, aside from PvP, the other mode is Operations, which is an extension of the main campaign, essentially. In each chapter of the campaign, Titus will say he needs another squad to help with a different objective, and the Operations are those missions from the other squad's perspectives. Like when he needs a squad to destroy the Tyranid hive mind, that's one of the missions. Great if you want to play with friends. I haven't gotten far in terms of difficulty modes. I don't know if the missions become different or if they're just more challenging, but playing these with friends is a great time, especially since you can coordinate which classes you want to choose and what strategies to implement, which adds a lot of replayability to the missions, like how would this play out if instead I did it tactical, I played as a bulwark. It gives you a ton of freedom and I love that, but if you were to all die, you automatically fail the mission and you have to load back in and do it all over again which don't know how I feel about that. And for most of these, you do the same things that you do in the campaign, shooting and slashing. But this time, you have a full-fledged progression system. Why wasn't this in the campaign? For every class and weapon, there's a progression tree, which you can buy with the coins that you earn by completing objectives in each mission. And this can allow you to add more damage, unlock different perks, you know, everything that you would expect a skill tree to give you. Each weapon tier also comes with a new skin for each gun, like a little ribbon on the side, progressing as you get more tiers. 
tiers, along with armor customization for each class. There's also a heraldry, which can give you the paint jobs of other Space Marine Legions if you get tired of being part of the Blue Man group, where you can also use coins that you get to get new paint jobs and emblems. Where are my Raven Guards at? There's six operation missions right now, and they've already said they're gonna add more, so this ain't gonna end for you, you heretic scum. Overall, these other modes are great, way better than I thought they would be, and if you thought the campaign didn't do enough to shake things up, these should solve those problems real quick. And like I said, we're gonna get more, so look forward to that, my fellow Ultramarines. Guys, if you are making a video game that is designed to bring new players into your franchise, I don't think you can do better than Space Marine 2. As a video game itself, it just brings you back to the time when games didn't require hours of investment and microtransaction live service bullshit. Games that you could just pick up at any time and have an absolute blast with. Even when I'm done with the process of making this video, I'm still gonna occasionally go back and do operations with the boys or do some more PvP, especially when they add more content post-launch. And as soon as I finish with the campaign, I wanted to learn everything about this universe because if all this badass is only a fraction of what it has to offer how nuts does this stuff get and just to remind you guys saber interactive is the same developer that's currently working on the kotor remake after playing this game and seeing the talent on display here i think we're gonna be in good shape just please no more development hell i got everything i wanted and more out of space marine 2 and it was an absolute blast to play now, if I may, after playing this game, I now have one request. Make a prequel game during the Horus Heresy. Glory to the Emperor, ladies and gentlemen, because Space Marine 2 is hands down a 9 out of 10.